Twintig. Ira Cohen Week. En dat doen we omdat we bij Kleurnet deze week de gast hebben, Ira Cohen. Hij is een Amerikaanse dichter, een filmmaker, een fotograaf, een kunstenaar in de breedste zin des woord. Iemand die met beeld en geluid en woord bezig is. Hij hoort tot wat we de Beat Generation noemen, mensen die in de 50 en 60 jaren begonnen met een alternatieve naoorlogse revolutie van ja, een soort protest tegen die tijd. Die tijd van toen opbouwen en zo. Mensen die met homoseksualiteit, met rassen, met drugs aan de gang gingen. Allen Ginsberg is het bekendste voorbeeld ervan, maar oh, Jack yeah. Kerouac, all those guys, yes? Yeah. Right. So, we're going to do this in English, Ira. Okay, And good. the program today is... Heel mooi, heel mooi. Heel mooi. Let's take heel a look. Mooi. Ira lived in Amsterdam for a while, so he speaks a little bit Dutch, but he just arrived today, and this is a Pandora box day. That means that he brought a lot of material and we're basically going to make a trip in the past and in the present of your work and your relationships, your, your relationships to artists, to people, to women, to whatever, because you've traveled a lot, uh -huh. Kathmandu, Morocco. Uh, Ethiopia was big for me, uh, uh, Amsterdam was very important for me, this was the magic city, magic center. We had Tangier Magic Center and we knew there was Amsterdam Magic Center and in those days I didn't know any other Magic Center. Because that's the story, when you first came in Amsterdam you were dressed up like a Moroccan well, guy. Well I came from Morocco, I did a magazine called Ganawa, that's the first thing I ever made a real commitment to. I published William Burroughs there, Brian Geisen, The Rights of Pan, uh, the first selections of a book called Sheeper by Irving Rosenthal that should be much better known even in America than it is today uh, and uh, other things, uh, Jack, Jack, great photographs of the uh, uh, marvelous Jack Smith uh, no longer with us as most of these people are actually quite a few of them no longer around. Yes. And uh, when I came uh, to Amsterdam I came out of Morocco uh, wearing uh, the only uh, cloak I had which was a silhem which is like a cape, a long, a long cape, not sewn together in the in the middle, a little sexier, you know, than that, and uh, uh, with a hood, you know. It was raining, actually, when I came to Belgium first, and then uh, uh, Alfred Chester, a famous American writer who was in Tangier, said, uh, don't forget, if you need printing, you can always go to Amsterdam, and the man you should check out is Simon Vincano. That was, was then, as now, the kingpin, He's now residing in his uh, garden uh, em empire, yeah. but in those days he was the, the kingpin of the uh, well, alternative. He was the, well, then he was 24 hours open house. Uh, it used up about five wives, actually, that style of life. <laughs> but uh, he, I like to think of him as the Sloitel Koning. As the key king, king of, yeah, Amsterdam, of Amsterdam, who opened the doors for Because you. I used to walk uh, late at night from uh, the Octo Borgval, uh, or uh, the Voorborgval all the way to Vespers Ida crossing. I remembered every street uh, that I would meet on the way. And uh, there was a big uh, store that said Sloetel... Uh, Sloetel Koning. Slo yeah, so <laughs> then I thought, yeah, th th I'm getting the message, I'm getting closer. You, you know? like this play with words. Yeah, in the course. car you spoke about Drempel. Yeah, I love Drempel. Drempel, so it's a great word. I love Drempel. No, but Drempel also, I remember the first thing when I learned the word is that then the, uh, someone told me, but uh, you know, there's a drempel phrase, fear of the drempel. So I was telling Hans Plum today that uh, we should do a children's book or some kind of interesting story where drempel is a character like a boogeyman. Mm -hmm. Is know? that now the sound of the word also? That yeah, the, in the, the sound of the word is great. And drempel. the idea of drempel phrase, because to me, this is a very crucial concept about Dutch psychology, attitude, uh, the you know, the inside, the, the psyche, you know, the lowlands, the dike, the finger in the dike, keeping away the waters, you know, to flow, overflow, the unconscious, <laughs> uh, the, you know, they, it's complicated as a archetypal you story. You think we don't sleep very well, do we? No, I say, <laughs> I know, I never went vodloping. Did you ever? You know, uh, yeah, a little bit, but then you that's realize. A, that's my favorite Dutch sport, actually, although they don't have international the competition. The competition, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the Dutch would win with no problem, you know. So, uh, but... Uh, now, Watlope uh, uh, exemplifies a little bit that we're on the surface of the water and right. 
you know, from the east we know the, the, the water, the sea is the subconscious, what's yeah. there. So That's are the Dutch working on this? Yeah, thing? in some way, yeah. And they love the, you know, uh, the idea and they, they love uh, something, there's something duck-like about it because you have to run away before the water catches you, bum, 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 <laughs> and big galoshes, I think, and everything. But the idea of Drempel phrase, fear of the threshold, because I understand that that's a concept in English, you hear fear of the threshold, psychoanalytic concept and so forth. And one of the reasons why Gazellic is so appreciated because the coziness and to not have this... Uh, but is Gazellic not a word that you that Jewish people also understand very well? Uh, Gazellic? Hamish, they would say. Uh, Hamish, uh, Hamish. Homely. But yeah, but it's the same word. But I mean, it's a special thing here because I mean, we don't have our windows open. We're afraid of being robbed, you know. <laughs> but, uh, well, but the Dutch exactly. like to keep the window there and have a nice-looking living room. Uh -huh. So, I mean, and the idea of uh, something that is awesome, you mm -hmm. know, the word awesome, full yeah. of awe, is also terror. But that's where I get attracted, you know. When I see a threshold, I want to cross that threshold. But some people are afraid of the threshold, and this is the where that expression... Price, the yeah. price. And what, and I'm just taking... Uh, well, I brought this along at the Ins and outs. It's, it was made in Amsterdam. It's yeah. a famous... And that's uh, the first issue with, uh, about the Festival of Fools in the early days with... Uh, what's his name? The famous comedian uh, Django. Django. Django, Django Edwards. Edwards yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. That's not him, I don't think. But, uh, you know, that his, he was a master of that yeah, yeah. festival. This, this was put out by uh, Eddie, Eddie Woods. Woods. And I was the uh, contributing uh, yes. editor and I had a lot to do with that magazine uh, yeah. uh, during the time yes. it came out. And in this particular issue, I don't remember what I have in it exactly. Well, this is Catman Cat Dream, Dream, Dream Piece. Catman Dream Piece. Yeah, and, uh, but the, I think also in this issue is a, a very big, strong poem that I wrote, which is uh, probably uh, a unique poem in the annals of uh, poetry of taking apart uh, Germany. Ah, uh, you're Jewish criticizing. Point of view. Well, it's not just criticizing, it's too complex to say anything so simple. But it's called the Stauffenberg Cycle, after, uh, and a book came out in Holland by that name, in the Amsterdam uh, series, see? The Stauffenberg Cycle. And then here is a picture of a building that fell over in the Kumbh Mail in Allahabad in 77. And you see it fell over, but it has the swastika on top, so I used this picture to indicate you know, how flimsy uh, the Third Reich, uh, you know. Th In those days, a lot of the B generation poets came to Amsterdam. Uh, yeah. Alan Ginsberg with his friends uh, came. Yeah, all of them, here. yeah, I know. All, all of them, them. came here. Yeah. Um, that doesn't happen lately, that. Uh, hey, uh, everything is uh, just uh, different. I was telling you before, I can't believe. Because oh, before, I, before you smoke a cigarette, yeah. I just. You know, these guys come with a packet that says Natural American Spirit. No, this is my girlfriend's pack of cigarettes. Oh, <laughs> I never buy these cigarettes, but I will smoke them. I will smoke them. And, you uh, see funny things. You I'm bring smoking a camel lights. Uh, I had a good friend uh, from the Reynolds tobacco family. Josh Reynolds, one of my dearest friends. And, so you're supporting... Uh, no, <laughs> no, he's dead now, you know, but uh, his uh, family created uh, the, the camel. camel brand. Yeah. yeah. Things that stay in our mind. Eh? Uh, Ins and outs. Listen, you brought a lot of stuff here. No, this is nothing. I mean, this, this is, is nothing. You have a house in New York that's no, full of. Yeah, the thing. I, I just at the last minute grabbed some small things because you said bring up everything you can, but don't bring the Paradise Now living theater film because it's a 16 millimeter film, and I said it was heavy. Yes. I would have brought it, you know. But when you said too we much need, of we a need problem, a match. Uh, yeah. yeah, but. Uh, I just took some of these things at the last minute because I thought, oh, I just came across this. Yeah. And then I thought, well, this was from Amsterdam. And in fact, here I have a notebook, which I kept when I was living in Amsterdam. And a friend of mine, the poet uh, Gerard Malanga, uh, was here for One World Poetry Festival. And uh, he, uh, uh, well, when he left, uh, we, had a, uh, we created our, the warmth of our friendship during that time as uh, Bronx buddies, you could say. And uh, during that festival, we ran around a lot together. So I ended up sending him, I tried to write him a postcard almost every day, you know. Yeah, I'll just take one at random. I haven't, take it, November I haven't looked at this since 79, uh, actually, this notebook. I've never published any of these things or anything. But uh, I'll take a chance on romance, you know what I mean? <laughs> and also on myself. But yeah, November 5th, from the telephone booths behind the palace, I make my calls, but things move slowly. You know, we could make free phone calls in those days with a safety pin 
the Israelis taught everybody, then the uh, uh, Arabs, and then I found out about it. Safety pin connecting the wire to the mouthpiece, and you could make long distance calls anywhere for Free. nothing. That's what I was doing. As Bill Levy says, the Dutch exaggerate their weaknesses. They have a terrible tendency to overpraise mediocrity and to be critical when faced with real quality. They are particularly tough on each other, and it is only the rare Dutchman who gets a claim abroad that excites respect and envy. I think I have more real respect for the Dutch than they have for themselves, in spite of their overbearing, overbearing chauvinism. This is a little tough, maybe. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> a unique tradition of eccentricity, the attempt to overcompensate for a deep-seated inferiority, the boundless enthusiasm, plus the rampant subsidy system, which virtually pays artists to store paintings in warehouses, etc., make for unpredictable equations. Where else could five poets travel to the very borders of the country and get $100 each to read to 10 people, half of whom also want to read their poems? In Holland, <laughs> one lives in a bubble of gas. Things haven't changed. But, so no, but this is a very affectionate thing, but I, you know, I'm saying uh, I'm writing to Gerard. There are many funny things. Oh, yeah, then I say, Postcard too. Now don't get me wrong, you know. I love Amsterdam. It's 5 a.m. and rain is falling into another morning in this cancer country where everything is surrounded by water. Robert Jas Jasper Grotevelt, the original spirit behind the Provo movement, now turned weather magician, must be unemployed or maybe he is making rain out of spite or sadness. Robert was the founder of the great Mary Who conspiracy going so far as to uh, warn the police about a shipment of hashish which he himself drove across the border. That was the German police, actually. Imagine when they discovered after hours of laboratory tests that it was in fact elephant shit that he was carrying, <laughs> just as he had claimed. They said a likely story, you see. <laughs> that was back in the early 60s, before Bart Hughes drilled a third eye in his head. You can pretty well do what you want in this town. Ever try smoking a herring? The Dutch are so considerate, they even put dots on their paper money for blind people to feel. Speaking of Allen, it was Gregory who put a golden dot on it, unquote, uh, whatever. Anyway, Books. they're different there. This is, this is what you wrote, traveling. Did you always do that when you say you were in the Kathmandu, you were always writing notebooks? When I was doing a good thing, I was doing that. Tangier is the best place for me in that regard. Yes. Uh, Kathmandu was good, Amsterdam was great. I had to, and I realized, you know, it's the, uh, just in being here just in a few hours, going to Raukwood with you and uh, just feeling myself there. Seeing that tower yeah, of Yeah, and uh, then all my memories are come rushing back and I know that uh, how great uh, everything was for me here. It couldn't have been anywhere else. It was uh, just uh, fantastic. I mean, I, I have, want to tell you, uh, you say beat, I'm always making a point. The more you protest anything, the more people, <laughs> you know, go the other way. They never believe you. And you mean you, you never won the war there? <laughs> no, what I'm saying to you is that uh, I really like to say that I'm not a beat. I love the beats. I knew all the beats. I published them. I wasn't technically, historically in that time frame, and I came from something else. Their influence, certainly, surrealism, Rumi, uh, ancient uh, cultures, uh, Babylon, whatever. Uh, but uh, uh, that uh, I really feel more part of something else which came after the beat movement, connected to it, contiguous to it, which I call electronic multimedia shamanism. Uh, when I'm reading uh, books which I have here that I just bought, the letters of Lou Welsh, uh, somebody that should be more famous even in America, certainly in Holland, where everyone has Ginsburg Burroughs fever. You want to light that cigarette? Yeah. You know, uh, then they don't know who Lou Welsh is, or Robin Spicer, or Jack Spicer, or Robin Blazer, or certain other, you know, people too innumerable to mention. Yeah. Well, talking about this techno shamanism this this but i was going to say the one point before i drop the stitch is uh, that just that i'm reading these letters of lou welsh who i have a great admiration for his greatest line ring huh we need a let's try that <laughs> okay ring is what a bell does you know and i could go on about this line and what it really means but i'm reading his letters they're so sad 
These guys are working in, uh, on uh, fishing boats, uh, trying to get enough money, begging for money from uh, you know, subsidies uh, that don't want to give them money because they're too far out. And in the end, uh, they're winos. Uh, they can't live with women. It wasn't a sexual revolution. It was a, a painful uh, act of growing towards a sexual revolution of people who could never find happiness in, uh, in a relationship, in fact. And he finally went to the Sierra Nevada mountains in a, a fit of despondency, left his car, and his body was never seen or found again. See, and I'm reading that and I'm thinking just how sad all of that is, and I realize I've been very sad, you know, at times, you know. I cried in the streets of Amsterdam on occasions, you know. One day I was walking on Yom Kippur, which was just yesterday, the day I left, you know, on the uh, Singapore plane, and uh, I was walking uh, in a certain area, and uh, I found myself crying. I didn't even know why, but I realized that I was right on, say, uh, what is it, the uh, Yoden uh, Braestrat, you know, where uh, many Jews had lived and no longer were alive, and so forth, and I was feeling sympathetically these feelings. But I never cried the way these men like Lou Welsh and Kerouac had these tragic, uh, you know, endings, you know, uh, being, uh, unable to cope with the, the time and the culture and their own selves. So you, you feel yourself optimistic then? It's not a question of optimism, it's just a question of, uh, well they had humor, I have humor, uh, it's something else, I don't know. I guess I enjoy a certain kind of luxury, uh, you know, that India, Morocco, other things have offered me in my life. And I don't have those uh, kinds of, pro I have other problems maybe, but I don't have those kind of problems. I mean, I uh, never had to work on a tuna boat, you know, uh, to you know, uh, yeah, or do, you is, know. Is the, one of the differences also that you were also a photographer and a filmer and a filmmaker? And well, that has helped sustain me because uh, I don't make money from poetry, but you know, a king can throw you uh, a bag of coins. Like uh, once uh, for Dowsey, uh, some king uh, uh, wanted to honor him and he sent him uh, 20 camel loads of silver. And Ferdowsi sent them back because they were in gold. <laughs> or a poem that Lee Poe wrote that was inscribed on a jade earring, sold for something like uh, $8 million at an auction centuries later. So poets have their own way of being kings and managing, you know, if they're lucky. Otherwise, they hang themselves from lampposts like Gerard de Nerval, or they uh, disappear into the Sierra Nevadas, or slip off boats like Hart Crane whatever the reasons but uh, yeah photography is also fun for me and is a great experience and it also can occasionally pay uh, though it's hard even to get the money there you know I see kids showing photos in galleries uh, these days that they sell for four thousand dollars and when I talk to someone who thinks I'm actually great so I'm a good friend who believes in me and everything else and if I ask for five they offer two you know what I mean so, you know, but let's, it's let's look at a few of your pictures because anyway, you, have, you have brought a lot of them. Yes? Talking about electronic, electronic multimedia shamanism, this is a poster we just made from an old slide I forgot I had taken of the great poet and musician Angus MacLeese. So he left behind cartons of tapes which for the first time now we are printing, uh, going to put out this CD that was maybe one bootleg record done before. This is, uh, CD will be called The Invasion of Thunderbolt Pagoda from a soundtrack to a movie that I made mm -hmm. of the same name which Angus is in. So he was a founding member of the Velvet Underground, you know. Things. We, uh, we have more. Yeah. A picture of, who is that? Uh, well, this is a picture of Eugene Unesco, which happens to be just, uh, you know, uh, potluck on the top of the box. Taken uh, when he came to New York to, uh, with a group of people like... Uh, Alan uh, Jouffroy and uh, Nathalie Sarro doing a play by Virginia Woolf in French called Freshwater and this was in the dressing room. But it's a beautiful expression on his face and nice to get uh, UNESCO with bare shoulders. Playwright. Great, very colorful things. This remembers we've okay, seen uh, this, uh, yeah, this Kumba is, Mela. Yeah, this is a picture of Sid Baba. Uh, he was a kind of uh, the outlaw king of the Ananda Akara. So, uh, you know, he had a lot. He had a lot of disciples, uh, but he was uh, somehow in, the, you know, considered that, like all the the real Apaches and the wild men that came into the Akara came under his sway, 
and uh, he died during the Kumail of 1977. And uh, because uh, he didn't want to be photographed by me or anyone, he was very uh, uh, difficult. But I happened to take a photo of him by accident when he was taking a shit somewhere. And, uh, <laughs> That's this one? Yeah, and uh, he was sitting in a beautiful position, but behind a bamboo uh, fence. And just as I took the picture, he began to rise up. And then, because he didn't want to be photographed that way, he didn't get mad at me. Instead, he called me over and asked me to make a serious portrait of him, which I did. So then he died two days later, and all his disciples came to me and asked me to take the last pictures of him in Samadhi. He's dead in this picture, you know? And to photograph him, uh, them with him for the last time, which was a special honor. Yeah. Colors in your life and uh, the Kumba Mela film uh, movie. Actually, what I want to notice is you don't. You're not so different from these guys. Which guys? From the Kumba Mela guys. From the no. Only, that's the whole secret of the movie. Is I'm. Uh, very, you're one of them. <laughs> I'm, but I can be one on one with uh, a lot of people because uh, I feel I have a kind of a chameleon quality, which is not to say I'm not myself. That I can change into something else and whatever, like a, a semblances and a hypocritical you know, uh, you know mm -hmm. <laughs> enactments, but uh, that I can just identify in some way uh, with them. But they saw me as, uh, you know, in that way. You but know. is that, is that it's the an attitude. of the camera or is it? No, a, it's an attitude in your life, you know, because uh, I have the same attitude. To me, the Naga position is, uh, you know, something that I could hold, uh, you know, very dear. You know, it's an ad a life attitude. What is the Naga position? Well, it's, uh, you know, the Nagas are really, uh, told me once, we are an army against the Orthodox. They also could be called radical abusers, as they were by Swami Yogananda, uh, followers of Shiva. Uh, but they're not uh, into monkey business of a certain sort. They're very serious about what they do. And if anyone interferes with them, they can get quite... I mean, uh, if some bourgeois guy comes over to their sacred fire and uh, doesn't take his shoes off and is just, you know, vo uh, looking at, I mean, an Indian, you know, yeah. just looking at them in some way and they don't feel he belongs there, they, I've seen someone pick up a log from the fire and throw it at him, that guy goes away, you know. So uh, they're very tough, they're like a warrior, uh, warriors. And, uh, but they're warriors for God. They're they're warriors yeah, for they're them. Naga soldiers, you know, they say this is... Uh, a camp, an army against the Orthodox, you know, they have their own, you know, uh, way. I always like the anti-Orthodox elements, you know, in uh, spirituality. The revolution, and, the protest, uh, the protest. Yeah, not just the protest, but just in the in the deepest spiritual sense of that, you know. Yeah, but you also like the... Like the Sufis as opposed to the fundamentalists, you understand the extreme. I don't believe that uh, the temple is, made, true temple is made of stones. We, we are the temple. The mandalas ourselves, the doorways uh, to the truth are the uh, doorways of our body and our, of our mind. So if you can't make the real offering, which is your breath, on the altar of yourself, everything else is just a simple show, you know? Life is a show, but it's surreal, isn't it? Yeah, but it's going to be a good show or, you know, just a, you know, some <laughs> other commercial crap, you know? <laughs> But if you use it the right way, it becomes it becomes uh, art. Do you feel yourself an artist, or do you feel yourself a craftsman in words or movies or pictures? Uh, well, I, I just try to do what I want to do. That's my fundamental precept. So, I mean, if I didn't want to write a poem, I wouldn't be writing a poem. Sometimes, of course, you have to do something for a reason, but it's not for money, although I love to work for money as well. But it's a difficult situation if you start out with that idea because uh, then uh, you never get to figure out what it is you would want to do yourself. You have to be patient uh, and take yeah, a bigger yeah. risk. So you if, you, if you're looking for the money as a, as a goal... Well, there's nothing you, you wrong with money. Them. As one guy once told me in India, he was a European who was uh, living as a sadhu with a guru there, and uh, he was going back to Biarritz because he had a, an 80-year-old grandmother and there was nobody to uh, bring in the uh, crops from the farm. He didn't want to go back there, but he was doing it out of love for his grandmother, filial you know, devotion, etc. And we were talking about money. He said, there's nothing wrong with money. It's like water. If it uh, stays constantly uh, flowing, it's beautiful and it's good. If it stays in one place, it gets stagnant and it gets dirty. That's why uh, in India, Let you, it flow. Yeah. Yeah, you realize that, uh, for example, for them, uh, taking a bath is really to be in a flowing river, not to sit in a bathtub 
where all the water full of the dirt that just came off you is what you're sitting in, you know, so that's a pure mm -hmm. concept and you see the simple comparison I'm making. Yeah, but there's, there's also energy in the rivers. The, the, yeah, and the, there's energy and money also if it flows, if you don't, when you try to hold everything, you know, uh, still it fucks everything yeah. up. Now, Reich, uh, Wilhelm Reich was one of the people who said if you take a copper pipe or whatever, and you put it in the water, you get energy, you know, straight energy out of the water. Ah, well, I don't have the time to try that method. There's a lot of other... You can fuck for energy if you want, you know. You can put out energy, you can exercise and get more energy, you can... There's a million ways to get energy. I don't know about standing around with a copper pipe in the water. But he had these uh, uh, quirky did ideas. Did you ever meet him, right? No, but I know Burroughs uh, uh, had a, an orgone box and he liked it being in the orgone box. And I agreed that there's certainly nothing wrong with going into an orgone box. It's not like being in a telephone booth without a telephone <laughs> to make the calls uh, from your third, Any box would do, you third, say. Third yeah, eye, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, hookup. Yeah, yeah. Before we go, another picture. Let's look. We have here a magazine called Express Magazine. Yeah. Social networking for global change. Right. So these are young people with these very positive ideals. They want to print on you know, uh, the right paper, everything is recyclable, they use vegetable inks. Uh, I gave them this, this is a photograph of myself called Astral Projection. The original Mylar picture made in a bendable mirror, which was the technique I was using, is completely different in the colors from this. Because I made a group of black uh, uh, pictures that they couldn't afford to print in a magazine called Caliban, mm -hmm. uh, they were done black and white. When I got a lot of copies of it, I started playing with colored pencils and drawing in the colors over the black and white and making something new, which yeah. seemed... But uh, so this is the same technique? No, this is the mirror photography, the Mylar photography. This is a keynote picture. It's on the cover of my CD, which you have over there under the silver book, called The Majun Traveler, or it's somewhere here. No, here. 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 See, this yes, is this a, is a CD. You know. But uh, that was made in Brussels, where I'm uh, reading. There's music on there of Don Cherry. Ornette Coleman, uh, Tibetan uh, horns, uh, Moroccan trance music, which I recorded and mm -hmm. put out a record, which I don't have right here at the moment, yeah. but I have 20. Well, we have enough. We box. have enough here. Uh, we're talking with Ira Cohen, who says he's not a B generation, but he's a 50s, 60s uh, American. Uh, uh, yes. Well, so well, like look, so there was a reason, you know, that they were called Beat, and there's uh, funny stories about it. Uh, Piero <laughs> Ellis had told me that he saw Allen Ginsberg buying beets in a market in France and he said the beets look like elephant balls and then I thought that's true they do you know the wrinkled and a certain yeah. thing elephant balls I thought that was great and then he decided that that's where the word beet came from but that was a cute surreal uh, <laughs> dip but the original story uh, well there's Beatitude there's other stories but uh, somewhere that Kerouac as a football player at Columbia University that the famous uh, coach there Lou Little said to him one day when he was not working out so well, Kerouac, you're beat. You know, in a sense of like you uh, tired down and exhausted and, out, and yes. down. But, uh, you know, Beatitude is a good point of view and everything. But, uh, you know, the beats uh, were a certain historical time frame. There are a lot of qualities uh, that they carried, a lot of great things, revolutions, you know, in the word and uh, anti-academic and everything else. But I'm just trying to connect more to something that is essentially psychedelic, mind consciousness expanding, uh, global, uh, shamanic, uh, you know, uh, not... Uh, well, well, well let's know, take a few of those. And, and psychedelic. Psychedelic. Uh, drugs, then. Yes? Uh, you lived in Kathmandu in a time that uh, at least marijuana there was... Uh, wheat was legal, yes? You had a market yeah, there for sure. that? Yeah, sure. When I first came there, it was legal, and even after that, it was uh, plentiful. People said, how did you live there? What did you live on? I said, well, luxuries uh, came easily. <laughs> luxuries you got for nothing, you know, like uh, basically. Necessity sometimes was a little problem. <laughs> but, uh, you know, things like uh, smoking, I mean, people could uh, just come to the house and bring me Whatever. the best hash that they had made themselves by rubbing it, which mm. what, I what, what did tell you, you happened to me today in Amsterdam and within the first yeah, hour the first, that I was here. That, That's Amsterdam. We are, we are generally... Yes, we know that Amsterdam is unique in that, all these ways. Yeah. But what did does, what has the psychedelic experience brought you? Mind expansion. Consciousness expansion is the fundamental meaning of the expression psychedelic yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, you know uh, I don't want to say, uh, I mean you could use a lot of other words but I think that uh, it gives you uh, 
uh, clearly other perspectives and can open you up. I mean, if you're just indulging and taking it all the time, you can just eat Oreo cookies and uh, yeah, do nothing, that. you know, whatever. But you see, but, there's a whole generation But for there. a conscious artist, it's very important. And if you trace back the history of it, and you suddenly uh, read Rabelais and see an incredible old chapter about the uses of hemp, you know, in a way that, uh, you know, he says, uh, hemp, hemp, parade, uh, James Joyce says in Finnegan's Wake somewhere, mm -hmm. and it's coming from these, yeah, I've heard Simon so, well, yeah, that many all times. these uh, sources everywhere in the literature, in the paintings of Bosch and uh, uh, Bruegel, uh, Rumi talking about do not take opium tonight, which clearly indicates that every other night <laughs> he was taking it would it. be uh, so these, these, to Yeah, but you can see it, Hieronymus Bosch with, with his, uh, you know, strange uh, figures, with his strange dream-like environment. Although today we were at Ruigort where they have a, a Tower of Babel and I had the same feeling. We were, we were walking in a painting of, of Hieronymus Bosch. Yeah, there were all those elements are there. It's a, a very good synthesis of uh, all the ancient things and the yeah. today things. Okay, but now you, in your generation in the 15 and the 16, especially in the 70s, lots and lots of people that are now in power took LSD or whatever. Uh, but when I look at Clinton or whatever, doesn't feel that that, that well, look, expansion a, a, tr a true psychedelic is not going to even say for political reasons I didn't inhale you know that's a, would be a ridiculous thing to say they make a lot of that as a standing joke in America to the, say I didn't <laughs> inhale or whatever you know there's been a million late night uh, jokes about that and I think if he did smoke as uh, obviously Jack Kennedy smoked and uh, a lot of other people that don't advertise it or the news the media never got into it, that that was a positive thing. And I think that there is some side of Clinton that is, uh, I would trust much more, uh, you know, they would, if I was a comedian, I would say, not with my daughter, then everyone would laugh, you know. But I would trust Clinton and uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, basic uh, commitment to some kind of humanism uh, more than I would trust uh, a guy like Nixon, who was the closest he probably ever came to a psychedelic was a plate of uh, cottage cheese. So, uh, uh, you know, anyway, Kennedy also, as we know, was opened up to a lot of things, you know, mm -hmm. and they were ta took acid. They weren't taking acid every day. Hard to be a politician and, you know, do these things anyway. It's yeah. another life, you know. W would you say that the inclusion of, say, all these. Uh different cultures now in the West. I mean, uh, Buddhism is there, uh, Hinduism is there, we, in the street nobody is wondering if someone like, when you came to Amsterdam they said, oh, a Moroccan guy, wow, wow. Yeah, nobody well, wonders now, we look at it and it's, it's colorful. Well, no, have people, we, have look, we opened people up? look at me all the time. Still? Even in my neighborhood, I wear a Moroccan gandour, it's just a tunic, you know, if I was an African wearing that, people would say, oh yeah, okay. But then they see me, they are not quite sure what's going on here, and but I have actually now there is, uh, you know, Moroccans and other Arabs uh, whom I have always for the warmest feelings for. And I love going in there just listening to Um Kultum and the music that they play. And uh, we always have a very good time with each other, joking and whatever. And they're living in my neighborhood and they, of course, are admiring <laughs> what I'm wearing. You're living uh, in where, where in New York? I live on Duke Ellington Boulevard, which is 106th Street in Broadway in the Columbia University area. So I grew up there at some point in my life. I had deaf parents, they lived there. My father died at some point when I was in my 20s. Uh, my mother died, uh, you know, in her late 80s. You know, and then the, I inherited that apartment. So I lived there and my daughter Lakshmi was uh, actually born in the same bed that my father died in. I take a great deal of pleasure in uh, these warm, close, connections, you know, that my mother was walked in the room and saw a child, her own grandchild, being born in front of her eyes, which she never had seen anything like that in her entire life, you know, before. Is that tradition that you, no, that you cherish? No, well, it's a tradition for me, it's an ancient human tradition, but uh, for me that I was also there, there's a great sharing in that. Do you miss that in America, a tradition, roots? Well, we have our own traditions, you know, but uh, you know, America is uh, fucked up in a lot of ways, and it's also great in a lot of ways. Uh, it's uh, unpredictable, uh, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, that's why, uh, uh, you know, so many... Yeah, but if you compare Labor Day Parade or whatever with the Kumbamela. No, I wouldn't compare that, but I mean, I'm saying there are 
other traditions that come out of whatever is a Yankee spirit. As we don't want to get into the sociology and history of that, all of those things. But of course, the family and all these things are breaking down the uh, urban, uh, I was going to say nightmare, but the uh, urban civilization uh, doesn't encourage those kinds of things. And as you yourself were saying, that there are certain risks with things like uh, virtual uh, reality concepts and everything, which can also make for a greater separation. You know, I mean, an inflatable rubber doll will never do it for me. You know, yeah. you were just saying that uh, techno shamanism is, is, is fascinates you. Well, I don't know that techno shamanism fascinates me. I'm just saying uh, shamanism or shamanism, however, is to me uh, a very important concept. And uh, there's all kinds of ways to perform, uh, perform acts or be involved in that. I mean, the original uh, tools of the shaman were the drum and the mirror, and they still exist. Uh, Angus was a drummer, and I was the mirror man with the mirror magic and the photographs. And I felt at one time when I realized that, that that in itself was a big bond between us, which we didn't really have to speak about. But uh, there are other forms of doing... Yeah, but the, the basic concept of the shaman is that he's the one who, not for himself, but for the other, goes out in the dream Yeah, he can, travel. World. Yeah, he he can, can travel. travel. Astral projection. And that's the name of that picture that I was showing you with the, the blue head coming out. Mm -hmm. It's called astral projection. And that can be done in every culture and in the sophisticated modern way. It's fascinating and we're living in the modern world. We can't turn our backs on it. I don't feel like I want to retreat to some primitive reality, but India meant so much to me as Morocco did for all those more ancient traditions which are still not eradicated yet, you know, though it's changing. I Do mean, you think there's wisdom, like uh, you, you were mentioning Rumi and the, and the Sufi tradition and, and, and in India you talk with the Hindus and, and, and the Buddhists. It's in essence for you all that the same? Is it all? Yeah, of course it's all the same, but uh, you know, different ways, uh, different strokes, uh, different meanings. But I think that any uh, Sufi, true Sufi would uh, get along uh, just fine with any uh, person uh, as true as he is to that consciousness which has to do with himself and finding the God. You know, the original uh, Christian concept compared to what it is today. For example, when I went to Ethiopia and I shared in their uh, 12th night celebration on the Epiphany in a little uh, fantastic ancient uh, town called Lalibela where the a uh, great famine had penetrated and whatever. The river was completely dried up. They had to bring a barrel, you know, of water so people could be baptized and so forth and the water sprinkling and everything. And taking communion, there was hardly enough food. I saw the real communion there taking place when little hungry children, you know, were passing one piece of hard candy from one mouth to another, you know. So I, I, see, it, I see the truth in real acts like that. But, uh, yeah, in Ethiopia, you see, the idea which is still held there is that uh, uh, Christ exists in every person. It's not the, the idea of uh, some, you know, bleeding statue on a wall that has to be genuflected before. I mean, uh, not saying any disrespect to any of these other concepts of, it, uh, you know, uh, all of this other, you know, kind of thing. But when the emphasis is taken away from uh, the inner temple, you know, uh, that uh, the idea that Christ exists in the heart of every uh, person or every true Christian is a much more glorious idea than any other idea. I mean, it was the first time I ever could realize in, the, in my life, in a living way, uh, the validity of Christianity. I could never feel that in terms of, you know, the uh, pomp and ceremony of cardinals and popes and mm -hmm. bishops and social work, even when it's good social work in the same way as I could there, in a much simpler way, where it still is existing as it uh, was when the word was given by St. Paul to an Ethiopian traveling in the same litter to or from Jerusalem, saying, you know what just happened, I'm telling you, man, you know, that, uh, you know, and then telling him the story, really, and then that guy taking it back to Ethiopia. And uh, that's the oldest uh, uh, church, I think, mm -hmm. really, is the now, Ethiopian Christian church. you were Jewish and you grew up in New York. Why didn't you go for uh, the Jewish mysticism, for the Jewish... Well, I go search. for that also in some way, but it's not uh, ever present and all around you. I mean, just like anything, it's a business, you know, uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's an important uh, way to bring a community together 
and give sustenance to most people, even extraordinary people, but especially to ordinary people in times of suffering and need. You know, to teach them and uh, remind them of uh, charity, of uh, the meaning of suffering, how to deal with death. You know, then those religion becomes bigger for people in times of trouble, and where else will that sustenance come? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not uh, denigrating it, but it was never for me any more than any church or building could contain those secrets for me. I found it on the open road. I found it on the mountaintop. Not that I'm a great mountain. Yeah, but, but you were just talking about Paul. Now he traveled to the world. He was one of the early yeah. organizers, so to speak. You would call him uh, vocalizers <laughs> of the church. Uh, he traveled around and he, he sent letters. He made notes. We right. might have lo for lost most of them, but you make notes. You do. You went around the, 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 the little known parts of the world, at least in the 50s and 60s, that was not so well known. Morocco, and other countries, Nepal. You feel like Paul. No, I don't feel anything like Paul. I think, for me, uh, my basic feeling about Paul, and this is really off the top of my heart or the top of my head, is that he was a bit of a stick in the mud, really. He's not, uh, yeah, that's you know, uh, he did his job, but he was, uh, you know, like a member, a father of the church, and uh, maybe that's where it all went downhill, even in a certain way, but he did his yes, but, job. But his poetry, his writing, survived quite a yeah, 2,000 years. Yeah. Yes, sure. letters to his friends and... Uh, well, yeah, anything that can survive for 2,000 years will certainly get some attention. <laughs> poetry will, uh, yes. Why, why poetry? Why not prose? Why, why do you think this colonization of words? Is it more powerful or is it, is it the grinding inside of the concepts that, that leads to these closed captioned well, look, I, I mean, poetry is different things to different people, and there are many ways to describe anything. And then when you find a certain handle that feels right, then that's great. So, I mean, sometimes you look for those handles to answer those questions. But I couldn't live without poetry. For me, the world would be empty without poetry. And I'm not speaking here of somebody who wins a book prize who might actually not even be the true example of uh, poetry, because uh, usually the as uh, Hethcote Williams said once, I always remember this line, fame is the first disgrace. You know, so, uh, I mean, poetry is something uh, deeper, more personal, and can be used uh, as a word to cover much more than uh, words on a page or even orally, you know, speaking, because there's poetry in, in action and uh, poetry in all kinds of other ways, something we call poetry as if it were a kind of salt without which uh, food would be flavorless, you know. So uh, it's a kind of, uh, I mean, for me, beauty plays an important part in it, as well as truth and a lot of other things that, you, you know, uh, platitudinous uh, ideas that are hard to define for people. But uh, it has to do, in the Greek uh, meaning of the origin of the word, poin, to make or to create or to make something new. And uh, it's actually uh, uh, not only true for poetry, but for any art. You know, uh, to uh, make something new out of yourself, your own experience, you know, that, uh, that you can keep and uh, pass on and communicate to others, you know. So, uh, so uh, the expansion of our awareness is basically art. Everything that is new is art. Well, I think that art often f foreshadows things that are what come about in science and everything else through the deep intuition of the human psyche and, it, and uh, mingled with experience. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so uh, for me, poetry is king. I'm really quoting Gregory Corso, wherever he got that, well, probably he just dreamt it up himself, but you know, uh, poetry is uh, special. I regard that as more sacred a calling than, say, photography, you see? I mean, I'm not, there's art in photography. I'm trying to practice it all the time. And you can do things in many media, but uh, to me, poetry is uh, the most essential. When you write poetry, do you have sometimes a feeling that you sometimes I write poems yeah. and I ask, and then one guy told me, yeah, but that is really that is from this or that uh, Sufi poet in the 12th century. Or well, naturally, yeah, but, well, every everything is up for grabs, you know. I mean, uh, if you listen to the wind, then uh, you may not realize it, but sometime. You might be writing a poem and you're actually catching the voice of the wind in the poem. It may be a conversation you heard in the subway. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, uh, the sound of uh, 
uh, you know, uh, um, and anything that has to do with sound and mm -hmm. so forth and so it's, on, it's, it's, yeah. and the words of other poets. And of course, a great inspiration for poets can be poetry itself. But the fundamental place from which it comes is from your own experience. And that's why some poets, uh, you know, who are untutored can reach uh, depths of poetry that another well-read person may never be able to touch. When Gerard Malanga asked me in a conversation which was supposed to be an interview, which was printed, the only part of the interview I thought I really expressed myself, you know, uh, well, you know, that I was really happy about, was he asked me one of those glib questions which can, you know, maybe tie you in knots. Where does poetry come from? So I said, well, look, I don't know, I can't answer. Well, okay. I said, there was a book I read by Lawrence Vanderpost called The Kalahari Bushman. I like his writings, I'm not a, uh, and that book impressed me a lot. But there was one place where he was talking about the Kalahari Bushman, saying these are people who are nomads, and they spend their whole life uh, wandering in the desert, and uh, whenever they see lightning, they walk in that direction. That's the thing that guides their whole life. They're walking, and then lightning is there, then they turn their course and they go towards that lightning. So they're following the lightning. That's a great way of thinking about a life, isn't it? So I said, for me, also the other fact is why do they do that? Can you answer the question? <laughs> maybe there is deep wisdom because... No, no, I, okay. Well, because maybe the lightning indicated there was water there, or rain. That's what? the point. It's very practical, you know, yes. because with all the other, you know, uh, you know uh, ornamentation of what you could say, the fact is that uh, water is the basis for life. And uh, they need water, and they so they go to the lightning because they know that water is sure to be found there. And I said, you can say the same thing for poetry. It's like a, a bolt from the blue, and you follow that, and the water is the poem, or the stuff of which the poem is made, in a way, as a metaphor, you know. Is openness, has openness to do with, with writing poetry? Yeah, it's a, a, a totally important. I mean, that's something... can never do it. Maybe you can fake it. You can w uh, be considered the most famous poet in your country for centuries, maybe, and still not, you know, have those qualities that make yeah. for the greatest poets. Yeah, but so the great poets, their openness transcends. When I read Rumi, when he says, oh, Kabir, leave a space for the friend in your, in your house or your bed or whatever. Um, knowing that he really means to make space for God or the yeah, well, unknown yeah. in your life. It still hits me. It's his openness that, trend, you know, it passes over whatever. Well, poetry, when you, when you create a work of art, whatever it is, I mean, artists have always said this kind of thing. They say, I don't know where it came from, you know? It's a mystery. When you look at it and it's finished, you say, wow, how did that happen? Sometimes you know because there's millions of ways to do it and actually even get there by cutting up pieces of paper, putting them in a hat, pulling them out. There's, all kinds of games you can play in ways you can, you know, push yourself. But uh, the real, uh, uh, the real uh, meaning of that is to get that, you know, uh, uh, you know, out of yourself. Let's see. That's the secret. What yeah. is inside has to come outside, and yeah. basically is what is outside. Do you see yourself as a Hindu or? What, what, what I mean, you become a medium. You know, it's like uh, in Cocteau movies. Uh, 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 or, uh, the blood of a poet or Orpheus, you know, uh, he's playing with the radio dials and uh, a voice is coming over, it's like the voice of God, he's taking dictation. It's like taking angelic dictation. You, I mean, if you figure it out and you look back, you can say, yes, I somehow I remembered something that someone said, I remember the sound of the wind, I can remember this thing, and somehow all those things are in those few lines, and the greatness of uh, poetry is the condensation of miracles you see, and experience in that way. So, uh, but uh, in a sense, all artists really feel that they're uh, mediums, you know, as if they're spirits. You wanna, you know, go and figure out. I can sometimes, uh, Dante wrote a wonderful book called La Vita Nuova. He was making a statement that was, you know, the new life and the new language and everything he was doing in that time. And uh, when he's, uh, it's a book that contains many jewels of poems, but in between he's explaining what happened. Beatrice was walking with other women coming around the corner. He looked at her, he was transfixed by 
her uh, uh, beauty and uh, bravery, uh, you know, when her father died and whatever it was, and then you get the poem and then you understand the poem. Mm -hmm. But if, you, if I would go back to most poems I wrote, I think I can remember just where most of those, sometimes you forget, but I mean where most mm -hmm. of those lines came from in a real way, you know, what you saw that made you write well, those lines right. and everything. Let's do that because uh, you arrived from New York today and take one of your poems, tell me and read it and let's have dinner. Yeah? yeah. You have a, a book with you? Or? Uh, well, I don't know. I have a cup. I have, maybe I could try it with one of these poems. All right, so. Well, here's one that uh, I just made and sent to uh, the uh, ink. Uh, this woman, Mona Kazandar, at the Institute de Mondarab, was doing a show uh, about the call of Morocco and influence on, especially, of course, they always want to focus on certain well-known celebrity artists, so uh, they're all pretty good choices. Uh, you know, Burroughs, Bowles, Tennessee Williams, uh, Allen Ginsberg, who never really stayed that long in Morocco, frankly, I don't see that. But mm -hmm. because it's so his fame. Moroccan. So yes. this was something I wrote. I came to uh, Tangier after not being there for many years. It was in 1987. I got off the plane. I got a, a simple cheap room uh, somewhere and I fell asleep when I was there, jet lagged and everything. I woke up. It seemed to be a kind of a half light. I wondered what time it was. I didn't have a watch, you know, I didn't know whatever. And uh, I thought. The place was fairly empty, but it's 24 hours. All the waiters look like Charlie Chaplin guys or Disney people with these long ears. And there was one guy with a big hole in his ear, like uh, that was big enough when he leaned over and his earring wasn't in the ear. You could see a Magritian cloud floating through his ear as a frame. <laughs> I love that guy. So uh, those waiters are all waiting for you. Hello, okay, Minty. I realized it was five o'clock in the morning. The garbage men were coming through in their rubber galoshes because they pushing uh, the garbage and the shit through the pipes, you know, even in the early morning. And uh, so I thought, oh, it's uh, five o'clock in the morning, not five o'clock at night. So I was completely, uh, you know, on the <laughs> schedule. I sat down at a table there where I spent uh, many, many hours over the years. I lived there under every uh, psychic condition you could imagine. And then I just thought about different things that I remembered that rushed back into my mind. And I, so I wrote it down. And uh, this is the poem. My heart feels like an uncut diamond. Though it is still the same, it is not the same. Someone speaks of a bridge to be built from Tangier to Algeciras, or is it Gibraltar? Yes, and then a highway to the stars, or more likely an elevator to the underworld, says yellow turban to white jalaba as the exhaust fumes from the bus engulf them, leaving behind not even a single shadow is that Mel play in a white jacket turning the corner? No, it is a figment of my imagination, escaped from the asylum. Is that Ian Somerville walking backwards up the street as if pulled by a giant magnet? No, that is William Burroughs making electricity from dead cats. Is that Tatjana glistening on Maxiton? No, that is the sun dancing in the sugar bowl. Is that Mark Schleifer wavering on the cliff edge? No, it is a promontory in the wind of time, about to fall into the sea. Is that Beethoven's Ninth Symphony being played up the street? No, it is the sound of the bread wagons rumbling over cobblestones. Is that George Andrews with two girls in hand looking for bread? No, it is an unidentified flying object about to So fascinated by lovemaking? Yes, that is how they travel. Is that Irving in short pants looking for trouble? Jane Bowles looking for Sharifa, Rosalind looking for her baby, Alfred searching for his lost hair. Is that the wig of it all? The past robe of my brain? the wind talking to itself. Brian is dead, and Jacoby is dead, and I am a not unhappy ghost remembering everything. 
the warp and woof of memories, her yellow slip, her shaved cunt, her idiot child. Dream shuttle makes me exist everywhere at once. The blind beggars led by children keep coming. They all have many houses. Words keep coming back, like bezezel for tits, lichin for oranges, like Mina, like Fatima, like Drisbarata dropping his trousers for an injection in the middle of his shop. The trunk is full of old sepia postcards, bare-breasted girls smoking hookahs, etc. We speak of the cataplana, the mist which, obscure, which obscures even the cielo, you cannot even see the hand in front of your face. We embrace. He says he thought of me only yesterday. He says there are always nine such men who look like us in the world and that we are the tenth. We speak of the gold fillets in the sky over Mulai Absalom. The garbage men in rubber boots go through the sako pushing wheel drums of collected garbage. An unveiled woman wobbles out of a taxi and heads home before sunrise. Paul couldn't believe there was a Karma Street, but I will never forget it. And Billy Batman, who made the best hash in the world, he dropped a loaded pistol in Kabul, shot himself in the balls, took some heroin, and lay down to die. Now I must get up from my table in the all-night Cafe Central. No more Dr. Nadal, no more window with red crosses and red crescents. The water thrown from buckets runs across the cafe floors and over the sidewalks, and I drop a dirham into the hand of a blind beggar singing in the dark on the American stairs. From Aeneas Nins, a spy in the House of Love, the women wear fireflies in their hair, but the fireflies stop shining when they go to sleep. So now and then, the women had to rub the fireflies to keep them awake. Gewichtsproblemen, Ayurvedische therapie? Kom naar Health and Wholeness, Leidse Straat. Uitgeslapen mensen zijn bij Corelli geweest. 2000 vierkante meter lichtcomfort, vlakbij het Centraal Station in Amsterdam.